Welcome everyone to this session, which is called Biophysics for Global Health and Sustainability. And this is organized by the International Union for Pure and Applied Biophysics. So my name is Christina Sisun. I work at the French Center for Scientific Research and I represent IUPAB and I will share this session. And so I will share the screen. I hope this works, I hope. Okay, I think yes, it does. Yes, your screen is visible. Uh, okay. You might just want to go to full screen mode. I hope I try this again. Is it better or not? That's always the problem. Not really. This will also be the problem for others. Um, Maybe you can first go to the slideshow and then share the screen. Yes, I will do that. Oh, it's the same problem. Um, okay, now I still have, um, so this is where the two and a half minutes go. <laughs> <laughs> and technical issues. Um, I, it seems that I don't get it. Okay. Is it better now? It's still the same thing for me. Okay, I don't manage, I don't know why. Or just share your desktop and yeah. do it or whatever. Okay, is it better? Yes, yes, yes now it is. Fantastic. Now okay. we have full screen. Okay, thank you, Anna. So okay, and see this you're is right not time about now. <laughs> science, but about technical issues. So yes, so welcome to to, to the session. Um, I will very briefly introduce IUPAB. IUPAB is the World Organization, a federation of organizations in biophysics, founded in 1961. And its aim is to coordinate and support research and teaching in biophysics through several activities and scientific events, and more particularly to support young scientists in this area. So before we hear about, uh, uh, we hear our panel, I will take a few minutes to introduce you to the concept of biophysics. Indeed, biophysics is a standing apart since it is a hybrid science and biophysics is a bridging scientific discipline in which the theories and methods of physics are applied and developed to understand how biological systems work and this at different scales ranging from molecules to whole bodies. Biophysicists are working within a variety of disciplines and fields, mostly centered on biological science, but they are also at the interface with chemistry, physics, engineering, mathematics, and computer sciences. Biophysics emerged mid of the 19th century when physicians concluded that living systems obey the same universal rules as inorganic matter. And one century later, physicists and chemists started contributing to life sciences by bringing cutting, cutting edge tools that permitted to reveal atomic details of biological molecules and structures inside of cells. Biophysics have been critical for building many tools and new tools are still developed. And I will briefly review some contemporary biophysics tools. These include spectroscopic and microscopic techniques for structural biology. And these tools are based on quantum physics and classical mechanics. Very recent techniques include free electron lasers, that allow describing very fast motions in proteins. Cryo-electron microscopy that gives high resolution 3D structures of very large protein complexes. And here we see the coronavirus spike protein, and this allowed to understand how antibodies bind to it. And the last technique here is cryo-electron tomography that provides direct insight into the cell interior. 
Computational modeling is another aspect of modern biophysics, and artificial intelligence is now very efficient in predicting protein structures. Molecular dynamics are calculations that are used to model biological systems like proteins or even viruses in interaction with membranes and this at the molecular level. Biophysics further includes tracking single molecules and cells and membranes in real time, as can be seen here on the left-hand panel. Um, this is done by combining optics and mathematical analysis. And last but not least, biophysics includes multi-scale modeling of organ systems. For example, modeling of cardiac function by integrating information at different levels from the molecular level to the full body and using here electrophysiology and biomechanics. So, Biophysical tools are critical to present-day research to unravel really complex biological questions, but they also underlie many applications in modern medicine. For example, biophysics has given us imaging using radiation technologies like magnetic resonance imaging, computed and positive emission tomography scans, these for disease diagnosis and therapy. And the physical principles behind this are the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and matter and magnetism. Biophysics has also given us the development of new devices. And this can be kidney dialysis apparatus, defibrillators, pacemakers, artificial heart valves. And all of these are sustaining life and also based on physical principles like electricity, magnetism, or rheology, that is a study of flow properties. Biophysics has also given us biomaterials and biomechanics, and for example, allowed uh, to invent novel materials for prosthetic limbs. It has also given us nanobiotechnologies that are used nowadays for modern DNA sequencing, drug delivery, and the detection of pathogens. And biophysics has also given us uh, environmental biophysics. These consist in tracking and modeling uh, our Earth from the stratosphere to deep ocean vents. Um, it allows us to track money and to monitor pollutants and also it provides us with new sources of energy, like turning by turning algae into biofuels. And by, again, there are physical principles behind this, uh, like thermodynamics, spectroscopy, quantum biology. So in summary, biophysics has established a way of quantitating biology, it has pioneered inter, multi, and cross-disciplinary science, and this is really important that many sciences work together. It provided a breeding ground for new methods and approaches, and I summarized some, and it produced foundations for medical applications and for environmental causes. So it is now my pleasure to welcome a panel of four renowned scientists who accepted our invitation and who will talk about important questions that they address through their research in the framework of biophysics for global health and sustainability. Our first speaker will be Matthew Higgins. He is a professor of molecular parasitology at the University of Oxford in the UK. His research team deciphers the molecular basis for host parasite interactions and diseases such as malaria to guide the design of vaccines. Our second speaker is Pim Shai Sheyen. She is a professor of biochemistry of Professor and Dean of the School of Biomolecular Science in Rayong, Thailand. And her research team has contributed to understanding the mechanisms of different enzymes used, for example, in biocatalysis and synthetic biology. Our third speaker is Jesus perez Hill, Professor of Biochemistry at Complutense University of Madrid in Spain. 
His work is focused on pulmonary surfactant biology and lung homeostasis and ranges from fundamental research to establishing diagnostic and therapeutic tools. And our last speaker will be Miguel Castano, professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University uh, of Lisbon in Portugal. And the aim of his work is to unravel the physical principles that determine the interactions of peptides and proteins with lipids that are related to viral fusion, so to viral infection, and to develop new drugs. So we will now listen to Professor Higgins. I will unshare uh, my screen, and so uh, you can share your screen. So please, Matthew, the floor is yours. Great, thank oh. you. You can uh, see uh, the slides there. Um, Excellent. And, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to speak to, to you today. Um, I'm going to tell you about how we use structural biology and biophysics to try to design better malaria vaccines, um, in particular targeting the blood stage of malaria, um, which as we'll see is the stage of the malaria infection cycle when the diseases and symptoms um, of, of, the, of, 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 the, of malaria um, are prevalent. So malaria is a huge problem um, up until uh, this current day. Um, it causes hundreds of thousands of deaths each year, and it causes hundreds of millions of cases. Um, the vast majority of the deaths in malaria endemic regions are of children under the age of five, um, because immunity to malaria develops, but this immunity is, is only partial, uh, sufficient to prevent by and large the fatal symptoms, um, but still not enough to stop malaria from being a, a devastating disease. Um, so while there are many different uh, mechanisms or, or approaches that we can use to try to reduce malaria incidence, um, including the use of insecticide treated bed nets, including drugs and medicines, um, the world urgently needs a malaria vaccine as well in order to try to stop um, and indeed hopefully to eradicate this disease. And I'm going to tell you today about one of the malaria parasites, the most deadly, um, Plasmodium falciparum. This is the life cycle of the malaria parasite. And as you can see, it's, it's complex. Um, it has a whole series of stages, both in a mosquito and also within an infected human. And the bit that we're interested in today is here on the right-hand side of this uh, figure. Um, when the malaria parasites burst out of the liver in this form called merozoites, and they infect and invade uh, human erythrocytes. One malaria parasite goes into each erythrocyte and some 20, 10 to 20 parasites emerge uh, 48 hours later. Um, and so through this process of malaria, uh, red blood cell invasion um, and growth within the red cell and bursting out again, um, the, the, the number of parasites in that infected person grows and develops, leading to the symptoms of malaria, many of which are due to uh, anemia or due to um, these infected red cells sticking within the body. It's also at this stage that a small number of these parasites differentiate into a sexual form called a gametocyte, allowing the transmission of the parasite back to the mosquito. So that if we can stop red blood cell invasion by malaria parasites, um, we can stop the symptoms and the transmission of the disease. However, uh, red blood cell invasion by the malaria parasite is a complex process for a number of reasons, and so it's been really challenging to develop a blood stage malaria vaccine. One of the reasons is that the structure of the cell that is involved in invading red blood cells, so you can see that here on the left, the malaria, malaria is caused by a single-celled uh, eukaryotic pathogen, um, and it has these compartments or organelles up towards the apical tip, the point, this, this end of the parasite. Um, and the machinery that the cell uses to drive its way inside a human red blood cell is held within these organelles. Um, and it's only released from these organelles just when it's required. And as a result, this machinery is hidden away, um, protected from being detected by the immune system. So that's one of the reasons why blood stage malaria is hard to stop through vaccination because of the, the, the protection of the machinery that's used for invasion within these organelles. 
A second reason why it's been hard to develop a malaria vaccine is illustrated on the right hand side here. You can see the four main uh, plasmodium species which cause human malaria. And then in blue and red, you can see a set of different proteins which are used by these malaria parasites uh, to make contacts between themselves and the red blood cell during the process of invasion. So these contacts are essential, uh, these contacts are required for invasion. However, the parasite is very cunning and can use one of these molecules in, in the blue and red circles to, to make contacts with the red cell. But as the body learns to recognize that molecule and produce antibodies which block it, the malaria parasite can switch and use a different molecule to get in. So this redundancy, this ability to switch the machinery that it is using for invasion um, is another reason why it's been challenging to work out which molecule to target through a malaria vaccine. And the last reason it's hard to develop a malaria vaccine against the blood stage of malaria is that it doesn't take very long for a malaria parasite to get inside a red blood cell. So it, it can only take, so from a malaria parasite bursting out of its previous red blood cell to the time that it bumps into another red blood cell and drives its way in can only be, is, is often less than a minute you know, with some 25 seconds or so from that contact between the parasite and the red blood cell to the point where the parasite is inside the red blood cell. So for all of these reasons, it's been hard to develop a blood stage malaria vaccine. We have a redundant system of invasion proteins, which can switch from one to another when one pathway is blocked. The process of invasion is fast, so there's not long for antibodies to act to block this process. And invasion proteins are held within these organelles, hidden away from immune detection until they're required, and their exposure is then transient. So as a result, uh, we need high concentrations of antibodies uh, present in, in our human blood, in our, in our serum, to block this invasion process. So high concentrations of antibodies are required for protection. And so what we want to do is work out ways to not just get more antibodies, but to get more of the good antibodies, because the better the quality of those antibodies are, the more inhibitory they are, the uh, fewer of them we will need uh, to drive this invasion process. So developing a blood stage malaria vaccine has been difficult, um, but where are we getting to with it and how are we using structural biology and biophysics to achieve that? Well, I'm going to tell you that there's an exciting candidate vaccine. I'm going to show you the structural and biophysical studies that we've been doing to understand how it works. I'm going to show you how uh, we understand antibodies that block it. And finally, I'm going to use, tell you how we're using that information to conduct rational vaccine design. So first, of those different invasion proteins, and now I told you that this was a redundant system of proteins, um, but one of these proteins called RH5 was found to lie outside this redundant system because RH5 is essential for malaria parasites to get into red blood cells, at least for Plasmodium falciparum, the most deadly malaria of humans. So in, in 2011, Gavin Wright's group uh, published that this RH5 protein binds to a molecule called basogen, which is found on the human erythrocyte surface. I mean, in this graph, they demonstrated that MEM6, which is a basogen targeting antibody, could block uh, red blood cell invasion by all tested malaria uh, species or falciparum strains. Uh, tested. So in other words, this is not redundant, it's essential for invasion. Um, and Simon Draper's group showed a few years later that if you immunize um, aotus monkeys in an aotus monkey model, and then you challenge them with malaria parasites, that those monkeys are protected. So on the y-axis here, you can see the fraction of these monkeys which did not require treatment with antimalarials because they did not develop parasitemia. And group B was one of the RH5 vaccinated groups. And group A was the group that had not been vaccinated. So you could see that after 14 days, all of these uh, animals developed malaria parasitemia to the point that they needed antimalarial treatment, whereas RH5-based vaccination um, prevented uh, that and was able to protect. 
Now in early phase human trials, again by the Draper group, it hasn't been quite as effective as this. Um, and so we don't want to use for length RH5 uh, in our vaccines. We want to use RH5 based immunogens, which just elicit the really high quality antibody responses. So firstly, how have we used structural biology and biophysics to understand the structure of RH5 and its binding partners? Well, in 2014, we published our structure um, determined by Kate Wright in my, my laboratory of RH5 in yellow bound to bathogen in blue, demonstrating how this RH5 molecule looks and how it binds to its receptor on the erythrocyte surface. More recently, we've demonstrated um, in collaboration with Uwe Schultz, um, we've demonstrated, and uh, this is work done by Abhishek Jamwal, we've demonstrated that bathogen is not alone on the surface of erythrocytes, but instead it forms membrane protein complexes. Uh, bathogen here in blue is interacting either with a calcium transporter PMCA or with, a, with another transporter, MCT1. So RH5 is not binding to bacigen alone on the membrane, it's binding to bacigen that's part of these membrane protein complexes. Uh, next, um, uh, RH5 is not um, alone either. It forms a, a, a multi-component complex containing uh, four other components. Um, and Brendan Farrell, working in my group, has determined the, the cryo-electron microscopy-based structure of three of these components, RH5 in yellow, CYRPA in blue, and RIPA in green. In this case, bound to an antibody in light blue that targets CYRPA. And through a combination of cross-linking approaches um, and um, alpha-fold predictions, he was able to build a molecular model of all of these components. Um, so yes, so, so this is just to show that through cross-linking mass spec, uh, using cross-linking and then mass, spectro mass spectrometry to find out which residues are close to each other, in solution, uh, sorry, in, in three dimensions in the protein structure, Brendan was able to piece together the structure of this protein complex. Um, and in particular, he was able to determine the first uh, structure of RIPA um, at molecular at level of detail. And RIPA is a large complex molecule formed of these multiple domains. And actually Brendan was only able to see the RIPA core as we've called it, and not this region that follows the ripper core, which we call the ripper tail. Um, and through alpha fold predictions, this is what the ripper tail looks like here on the right. We believe that it's an elongated extended structure, which emerges from the ripper core protruding from this region of electron density. So by combining all of these pieces of structural and biophysical information, we've been able to build this uh, model uh, for how um, this whole protein looks. Um, and then Brendan was also able to show that, I, I told you that this was a five component complex, but I've only shown you the structure of three of these components. The other two components, CSS and PTRAMP, form a complex which is attached to the parasite membrane. And Brendan was able to show that full length ripper and also just that ripper tail are both able to bind to CSS and PTRAMP with the same affinity. And he did this using surface plasma resonance measurements. So to summarize all of that data, we know that bacigen is present on these membrane protein complexes on the erythrocyte membrane. And we know that uh, PTRAMP and CSS are found on the merozoite membrane. We know that RH5 is part of this uh, three component complex, which we now see the structure of through cryo-EM and alpha fold predictions. And we know that this uh, PTRAMP and CSS complex is on the parasite membrane, in which it interacts with the ripper tail. So in other words, this big protein complex spans the parasite membrane all the way through to the erythrocyte membrane, generating this bridge which links these two membrane protein complexes together. So we're starting to understand through structural biology how parasite and red blood cell are linked during these essential invasion processes. So can we use that information to design better malaria vaccines? And this uses the classic approach of structural vaccinology. And this is all done in collaboration with Simon Draper here in Oxford. 
So Simon has team vaccinates human volunteers with uh, RH5 based vaccines, and then use single B cell sorting to get antibodies from these, um, and then assess the quality of these antibodies. Uh, my lab understand where these antibodies bind across the uh, protein components that they target, um, and use that to try to design more focused vaccine immunogens. So how do the most effective RH5 targeting antibodies work? Um, so we've, we're studying all five of these components, but I'm just going to tell you about RH5 today. So human volunteers were vaccinated with RH5, single B cells were sorted, and um, antibodies were cloned and tested. And this was done by Dan Alanine, a joint student between Simon's lab and my lab. And Dan was able to group these antibodies into classes. So within each of these rectangles, you can see a set of antibodies which can't bind to the antigen RH5 at the same time. In other words, these are called competition groups. Um, and on the y-axis, you can see the EC30 of the growth inhibitor activity. So low concentrations of antibody are able to block growth or invasion of red blood cells by malaria parasites in the red and the blue cases. Um, and then we were able to study these different antibodies and understand how they bind and where they bind. So first of all, again, using biophysical techniques, surface plasma and resonance, Dan looked at the EC30 of these different antibodies, and he looked at the KD, he looked at the off rate, and he looked at the on rate that these different antibodies had for RH5. And the best correlation between what these three different kinetic parameters of binding and protection or growth inhibition was actually the on rate. So in other words, antibodies that bind fast are better in malaria. And if you remember, I told you that it only takes seconds for a malaria parasite to get inside a red blood cell. And that's why these antibodies only have a brief window at which they can act. So antibodies that bind quickly are better than antibodies that bind slowly. Dan was also able to use crystallography in this case to understand how the red antibodies and the blue antibodies binds to RH5 and to understand where their epitopes are. So we know where within the RH5 molecule, the top quality antibodies bind and how they bind. Um, and we also know through comparison with Abhishek's data on these membrane protein complexes, that these best quality antibodies, for example, the red one and the green one here, project off RH5. So these red and green antibodies are binding to RH5 but they will be preventing RH5 from binding to basogen because in that conformation, they block the interaction with the red blood cell membrane. So these antibodies bind to that top half of RH5 as we imagine it away from the CYRPA binding site where they will clash uh, with the membrane, uh, stopping RH5 from binding to basogen. So lastly, just for the last couple of minutes, how can we use this information to design improved vaccine candidates? Well, we now have a load of different structures of antibodies bound to RH5. You can just about see RH5 in the middle in yellow, bound to all of these different antibodies in different colours. And all of the growth inhibitory activity positive antibodies, in other words, the antibodies that can stop malaria parasites from getting into red blood cells, these all bind to the top half of RH5, above that dotted line. Um, and the best antibodies are the orange and red ones here, which approach this particular surface of RH5. And the less effective antibodies bind down at the bottom. So we're in the process of designing and producing a set of vaccine immunogens to test these, in which we focus down on the key antibody epitopes. So RH5.1 is full length RH5, which has already been tested in human clinical trials by Simon's group. Um, I'm going to tell you in the next couple of slides about this antigen here, which is um, a large part of RH5, but it's been truncated to remove large flexible regions at the end terminus and in this central loop. And it's also been thermally stabilized through methods that I'm going to tell you about. Um, in a minute. Um, and this vaccine immunogen is under uh, clinical assessment at the moment. Um, we're also designing uh, vaccine immunogens using protein design methods, um, uh, which binds, which contain just the top half of RH5, where all of those good antibodies bind. 
And lastly, um, this image in where we've taken a synthetic scaffold and we've um, grafted on the key antibody epitopes uh, for those yeah, orange and red antibodies. So I don't have time to tell you about these today, but this is the most progressed. So I'm just going to give you a couple of slides on that before I finish. So this was a collaboration with Sarah Fleischmann um, and A.D. Goldensberg at the Weissmann um, Institute, who developed this really beautiful method whereby you can use Rosetta-based protein design um, to repack the core of your protein to make it more thermally stable and to make it fold better. The reason we did this was because RH5 is quite hard to produce and, and, and a vaccine for, for countries which don't have a high growth domestic product, uh, one would wish the vaccine to be cheap to produce and to be thermally stable. So this method works by doing a multiple sequence alignment and looks for variable sites across that sequence alignment. And then it allows those sites to vary in silico and it uses the Rosetta scoring function to score whether those uh, changes um, are likely to make the protein core more stable and the protein fold better. Um, and so we built up a set of somewhere in the region of 20 mutations, um, which collectively made the protein uh, more stable. And indeed, this worked on the gel on the top left. You can see the production of RH5 in E. coli. You can see no protein is produced at all, whereas um, the HS1, 2 and 3 variants, these thermally stabilized variants expressed really well in E. coli. Um, you can see that it binds to basogen with the same affinity. The structure was identical, but the thermal stability uh, was far stronger. Um, and so this vaccine immunogen, which is focused because we remove these flexible um, these flexible regions, which are the sites of binding of non-neutralizing antibodies, and which is thermally stabilized, is now in production at the Serum Institute of India and will be used in a phase one clinical trial um, later this year as we continue with our previous vaccine development strategies. Um, so our conclusions from this talk, the structure of this RCR complex in RH5 reveals this bridge which links the parasite and erythrocyte membranes. And is every component in that bridge is a vaccine candidate and is essential. Um, secondly, we've used structural studies of the best antibodies to find how antibodies neutralize um, invasion um, and how they should be presented in a vaccine. And finally, we're using structure-based design to generate improved vaccine immunogens, which elicit just the good antibodies, the higher quality antibodies. Um, and the first of these is in production for phase one clinical trial at the moment, with other ones in preclinical assessment. Now, as I went through, I think I mentioned the people involved in this work, but uh, here, are, here are some of their faces. And we're very grateful to the Medical Research Council of USAID and the Wellcome Trust for funding. And if you're interested in our work, do check out our website there as well, higginslab.web um, at Oxford. Um, and thank you all very much uh, for listening. Um, I will uh, unshare because we're on a tight schedule and hand over to the, the next speaker. Thank you very much, Matthew. And we will switch over to our next speaker, Professor Pimshai Shayan, um, who will talk about. Okay, there you go. So please, Bimshai. Okay, all right. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank our, all the organizer for like inviting me to participate like in this uh, wonderful event. And so I'm speaking, you know, like from uh, from Thailand, and this is uh, the picture of the our institute, which is like in, in short is a long name, but you call, can call our institute and in short as Vistec. And so we are in Rayong, which is in the green area, and in the in the innovation park that uh, the Thai government designed. That this would be another like another hub for the innovation in Thailand. About two hours from Bangkok, about one and a half hour from the major airport, and so my like in the lab that what you know like my fundamental part on the basic science like stem from the our study in the various reaction of redox enzyme in enzyme mechanisms and we like we have been exploring in the various system particularly on the flavin dependent enzymes mechanisms and catalysis 
And you know, in recent years, we have expanded into the enzyme engineering biocatalysis, and as well as in the synthetic biology metabolic engineering. And also, we try to apply our knowledge whenever that it fits into the like detection and the bio report systems. And towards these, the SDG goal that our group have been collaborating and working on the various system to support circular economy. So in the way that we see this as an important tools for the sustainable future, because we generate a lot of waste and particularly the bio waste can be like converted by various enzymatic system and uh, or the metabolic engineer cell to make a valuable compounds from the low value waste or the biomass. And our lab, you know, like our goal is also work towards several projects that to support the, the sustainable development goals, or like the, with the Tanya Pon Wong Net collaboration in the broader like network group and in the various groups as well. We work on, you know, not only on the enzyme and metabolic engineering, but as well as the anaerobic digestion and, and process engineering. So with this, we also work with the community that where we selected the like the starter for efficient the anaerobic digestion and put this into the, the zero waste digestion. So then this way it promotes people to segregate trash. And so then, so other type of the dry trash can be used in the recycle manner for the, the like organic waste or food waste. Then it can be used by this and aerobe to produce biofertilizer and biogas. But for the story, the, the major story that I'm going to share with you today is on the enzymatic system that can help on the pesticide decontamination and on the pesticide detection. So pesticide decontamination and pesticide poisoning is a big problem worldwide, particularly in developing countries such as in Thailand. So all around the world, you know, like is like hundred million cases have been reported to like to be having problem with uh, pesticide poisonings. And majority of these victims are poor farmers. And among pesticides, organophosphate and organochlorine are also ma major groups of pesticides. So with this, you know, like once it gets into the environment, it gets degraded, particularly by esteres or etheres, and to generate the core structure, which is, is a phenolic derivatives. This type of phenolic derivative is still toxic like to, like to human or to, you know, like to animals because it contains phenolic derivative, contain halogenated phenol or nitro, like containing group of phenol. So we have been studying from basic science part, we have been studying one particular enzyme, we call it HAT A monooxygenase by solving the structure, three-dimensional structure of these enzymes and study reaction mechanism. And we found that, understand that how it's work by the enzymes by to the, let me just put my, my pointer. So the, by binding to the, like this a structure, it's a structure of the FAD. So the enzyme using the reduced flavin at the starting, like the, the particular, the starting com active complex, reduce flavin reacting with oxygen to form a reactive species called C4A hydroperoxy flavin, which can incorporate this terminal hydroxyl group into the into the like into the like nit the phenolic substrate. So with this, for the compound to allow the compound to eliminate the toxic uh, halide group and to generate benzoquinone, which is it can be reduced and re-aromatized to be the phenolic uh, product. So we have been working for this enzymes for, as you can see in publication list for more than five years, about seven or eight years. We understand the system like in the basic science like completely. And so one, one of the, the issue that amazed us for quite some time is that this enzyme is good for like has can can use a wide variety of 
phenolic derivatives as substrates. So we've been wondering what can be the application on this part. And in 2016, it was lucky that I attended the conference in Japan. So that on the bioluminescence conference. So then I listened to one of the talk by Professor Oba from Japan. So he'd been sharing the discovery that benzoquinone once is condensed with a D-cysteine and then it can form D-luciferin, which is a, the substrate for the enzyme uh, luciferase, particularly a firefly luciferase in this uh, structure. So then we got the idea that because we have the enzymes, which is like HAT A, that can detoxify or eliminate either the halide group or the nitro group from phenolic substrate. So that can be generated to form uh, benzoquinone. So we got the idea that how about we couple the two reactions together. So if we provide a system with the in now we can convert the toxic, the phenolic like compound into the valuable D-luciferins. So we tested the idea and if we found that indeed the couple reaction can generate the D-luciferin with the properties exactly the same as the, the, like the, the synthesized uh, luciferin. So it can also generate light that can also, you know, like to emit light by adding the firefly luciferase into the system. So then with this concept, that was we published this work three years ago. So it's a concept that we can couple enzymatic reactions that we understand it can use variety of the phenolic derivative in to do three things. So the first thing is that to use the enzyme to do the detoxification of these halogenated compounds and then to synthesize valuable compound like luciferin. But when we add the luciferase, now we can generate the application or innovations of the detections of pesticides. And then, but by that time, three years ago, we know that we published the work, but we know that we need to improve the work further because the yield of the luciferin synthesis was quite low. And it could only, this couple reaction could only use phenolic compounds, but not the real pesticides. So we further develop. So then this is using the program, particularly on the fire plot uh, program to generate candidates of the mutant to make the enzyme more stable. So then we can increase the more stability of HAT A. So then this way HAT A can be used at the toolbox. So we further develop the cascade reaction mm -hmm. to generate the continuous supply of the cofactor. So then we can generate the deluciferin by converting the phenolic derivative. This way we could improve the yield up to 50%. So now we have a toolbox enzymatic cascade because it's HAT A for preparation luciferin, we call the reaction called HELP. So with this reaction, now we tested reaction with various, the phenolic substrate, so in overall, we tested 17 phenolic substrate. We found that this reaction can convert variety of these phenolic compounds, which is derived from either from agricultural like usage from the pesticides and can it can also be generated by industries or by the environmental use of this like, of this uh, phenolic derivative. So with this reaction, it can convert this phenolic derivative, 17 compounds into seven, into eight types of the luciferin. And to our, like, like uh, we were glad that we could also gen, like, synthesize the new compounds, new luciferin as well. So with the 405 dimethyl luciferin and 5 methyl luciferin, this new compounds, in fact, generate light in the longer wavelength, like such as the generate the color almost in the red color. So this can be uh, quite useful for the applications for people particularly using this luciferin luciferase in animal like applications. So this way, uh, this luciferin can also generate the, the brighter light than the native luciferin. So currently we are develop, developing like three application based on these systems. So the first is to use a HAT A to do the bio detoxification. So then this way we can come, we hope that to come up with a solution to do the decontam decontamination of the pesticide detection, detection. 
and the ability of the help reaction to synthesize variety of the deluciferin derivatives. We hope that in the future can contribute to the many like colleagues that will work with the animal like testing system. So then to make the system more efficient on the monitoring the like the bio reporter on site without like with the reduce the number of the animal requires. And for the third application is to use the system to do the detection of the pesticides decontamination. So with this, we developed the technology we call LUMOS. So LUMOS just like in Harry Potter, where you have light, where we have pesticides now, we should be able to see light. So with the luminescence measurement of the organophosphate derivative. So we like constructed the reaction now with the real starting precursor as a pesticide such as parathion, EPN, profenophos, and the uh, various compounds. And we use the etheres and S, uh, the SRS to generate the first to degrade into a phenolic derivative. And then later on, couple it to synthesize luciferin. So once we put the, this system and then we tested the system ability to detect, like ability to detect this pesticide. So the good part about having the signal of the luminescence is that we don't need to pretreat the sample. Even the like the dirty sample, the crowded sample, such as in the urine, synthetic urine or serum or the solution that we wash from fruits from the environment. With this LUMAR technology, the detection level is actually can go even go down to the part per trillion. So the the it's equivalent to the like the sensitivity of the LCMS uh, method. And so we tested ability of these compounds, as you can see that this ability, actually we can even visualize this by eyes as I will show you in this video. So like, so the whole work, if you are more interested in this work that we all also just published this uh, last year in uh, Uncle Bante Kimi, and this raised uh, a lot of the interest from many international news outlets. Just last week, I just came back from uh, the province in the northern part of Thailand, a uh, province called Nan, where we have the, like, the, the project together with the social scientists that we work and try to develop and implement our technology for the real use of uh, local people. So in Nan province, there are a lot of this contract farming where there are a lot of usage in the pesticides and a lot of this uh, chemical fertilizer in, you know, in growing mess that to make it for animal feed. So with Lumo technology, we help the farmer in the village that in called Prong Sanuk that they want to monitor the system, the contamination of these pesticides in the water, you know, in the soil. So we collected the sample and with the technology, it can even, it's uh, simple enough to, to, to work on site in the province where you don't require sophisticated laboratory. So together with the anaerobic digestion team, we work this as a model that hopefully that we use the LUMOS technology to detect, you know, to increase awareness of the you know, local people in terms of the, they need to monitor the level of the pesticide contamination, but with the zero waste technology to use the food waste to produce the biofertilizer. So then we provide them with tool in order to do the more of the healthier and uh, safer the agriculture. So then this way they promote them to grow the high value herb instead of the growing the high utilization of the pesticides. So this work have been, like involve a lot of people in the big team, particularly the one on the left, the Prashaya Vetai Song, which is, is uh, like the whole LUMAS project was his uh, PhD thesis. But now, you know, like he's graduated and then uh, trying to further develop the, the technology that, you know, like try to work 
on this to implement this to be in the real usage. And also various people in the team that have been contributed to this technology all along and have been have to thank all the people who work together, not only my lab, but in many labs that we work together and in as a network. And thanks to all our funding uh, agency that to support uh, the work in our group. Thank you very much, Pim Shai. This is really exciting science. And thank you also for sticking um, to, to time. So we are now uh, moving on to our next speaker, Jesus Perez Gil from Madrid, uh, who will share his screen. Good um, morning from Madrid. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Let me see. Yes, very good from the sound. Yep. That should be my screen. Excellent. Yes, perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me tell you that it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and a honor to share with you uh, a bit of uh, the research we have been making for many years trying to apply biophysics for designing better um, respiratory medicines. Um, first, let me to introduce what is the reason why we are coming to biophysics in connection with respiratory mechanics. What is important uh, for you to realize is that uh, um, in our lungs, we are exposing about 100 times more surface to the environment that we expose in our skin. That is a challenge from a physical point of view because we need to maintain such a large surface fully exposed to air continuously uh, while we protect it and defend it against the uh, potential entrance of uh, pathogens. But there is another challenge because this uh, surface is very dynamic. So for you to realize uh, we are introducing in our lungs about uh, uh, 15,000 liters of air per day and the resting conditions that can go up to 50,000 liters of air per day. And within this air, we are introducing uh, contaminants, uh, uh, particles, uh, potential pathogens, and uh, very close to the blood where we need to expose this air for, in order to get the, uh, the oxygen we need in, your, in our metabolism. So as I said, this is a, a major problem uh, from a physical and a biological point of view. The system we are, have been working uh, during the last um, uh, 20 years or so is related with the defense and the stabilization of such a large surface. If we go to the real structure of a lung, here you can have a, an electron microscopy picture of uh, a lung from a mice. Uh, you go to some detail, you see uh, the structure of the uh, alveolar uh, spaces in the lung where the surface uh, is exposed to air and the uh, uh, air and oxygen exchange occurs. But what is important to realize is that this surface is wet. So there is a, uh, this yellow line is, is indicating that there is a very thin layer of water covering our, the surface of our lungs. This is important because Within this water, there will be some important uh, molecular mechanisms to maintain an innate defense uh, system to, in, in, an, in charge of protecting our lungs from the potential entry of pathogens. But the water is a physical problem because within this uh, bulk uh, aqueous phase, the water molecules establish uh, polar interactions among each other, but the, the, the mo water molecules that are at the surface don't get uh, enough molecules to compensate that, uh, those interactions. The result is that these surface water molecules have a net uh, force component, which is called surface tension, which uh, means that uh, opening this surface costs energy. And that energy uh, is against the increase in a surface we have to do in each of our breathing cycle. When we inspire, we open our lungs more water molecules need to go up to the surface and that costs energy because they need to break a, a interaction that cannot be formed at that surface. And the pressure uh, that is opposing to this opening is defined by the Laplace law, which means that the pressure that is pushing to close these air chambers, like the alveoli is directly proportional to the surface tension, gamma, and inversely proportional to the radius. 
meaning that the, the, the smaller the alveoli, the stronger the pressure to be close. Uh, this is a major problem. Uh, the evolution has solved that by um, creating a system which is a pulmonary surfactant, which is a surface active agent, which is uh, um, synthesized and secreted to the surface of our lungs. There it, it um, um, somehow substitutes water molecule from the exposure to air. And that reduces surface tension and therefore the force opposing to opening our lungs. Um, it's important to realize that in the absence of any surface active material, we will need more than 60% of the metabolic energy used for the mechanical work of breathing. But in the presence of surfactant, we need only 3% of that energy. And that is the importance of such a system. And the system, and here you can have a, a skin showing that in our alveoli, we have a specialized cells, 82 cells, alveolar type 2 pneumocytes, in charge of synthesizing and, secret and secreting this material, which is rapidly absorbing to the air-water interface, reducing surface tension, and facilitating breathing mechanics. Well, if we go to some details, we will see that this is the way that the alveolar epithelium is continuously stabilizing the, the, the lung. And uh, you can have here a picture in which you see how the uh, pneumocytes are synthesizing this material. Here it is stained with laudan, with laudan which is a, a lipophilic uh, fluorescent prof. Each of these organelles is a lamellar body. Here you have some detail in an electron microscopy showing how surfactant is stored in the form of tightly packed dense uh, membranes, which upon secretion, absorbed to the water interface, form a multi-layer film. This is excluding the exposure of water to air, therefore reducing surface tension and facilitating the stabilization of such large surface. Some elements in, in this material are also intercalated in these layers and participating in native defense, so that at the same time, the, this material is stabilizing physically the alveolar water interface, but also defending biologically our organism from the potential entrance of pathogens. Well, there's different pathologies related with um, um, uh, the lack or the dysfunction of pulmonary surfactant. One of the better known pathologies is uh, what happened in uh, the immature lungs of preterm babies when they are born before their lungs are maturated and have synthesize the surfactant that is required for establishing the air uh, respiration. If, if this is the case, the lungs cannot be open of these premature babies because they don't have the material required to stabilize the air water interface. Now uh, we can solve these problems because these preterm babies are treated as early as possible after their uh, delivery with an exogenous material to replace what the lungs have not have not been able to, to synthesize yet. And if, if you look at the mortality of premature babies along the, the last year, you see how late in the, in the 90s, in the late 90s, in the last century, there is a very sharp uh, uh, decay in mortality as a consequence of the establishment of this pulmonary surfactant exogenous therapy. Uh, I have taken some data, the, the last data are from 21, showing the difference in mortality before and after the establishment of this pathology, but also to show how there is still a long way to improve the situation for the mortality of these preterm babies in different countries. And this is something that uh, depends not only on the, um, um, let's say, spreading of this technology on, on uh, supplementation with uh, an exogenous surfactant, but also the critical care of babies that are born very early and they are very, they require very, very um, uh, extreme uh, critical cares. Well, the research in this field are dedicated mainly to understand the molecular mechanisms of uh, occurring in surfactant and using this knowledge to produce better therapeutic materials. And we have been collaborating, for instance, with different pharmaceutical companies to produce new surfactants in which we can combine lipids and synthetic proteins and peptides to make a material that can be used extensively 
for the treatment of different pathologies. Um, we need other materials because uh, there are other problems related with inactivation of, of surfactant when there is lung injury and, and uh, an inflammation in the lung that uh, creates uh, an environment in which uh, phospholipases are liberated, oxidation uh, as a consequence of um, inflammation is inactivating surfactant. And again, we need to replace that material for the lungs to work properly. This is also what is happening, for instance, in lung injury as a consequence of COVID-19. And uh, we are now developing studies to understand how we can restore surfactant function in, in these cases of a lung injury, but that requires development of new surfactants that are resistant to inactivation in enough amount to be given in a re repetitive way to the, to the patients. How we can study that? Well, we have developed over the, over the years some uh, in vitro techniques to mimic the mechanics of lungs in, in, in uh, let's say, simplified systems. This is what we call a cathy bubble surfactometer in which we can measure the action of a pulmonary surfactant preparation against an air bubble. This is an air bubble in this video that is somehow mimicking how an alveoli is working. Here you can see how the injection of a very tiny amount of surfactant uh, produces open absorption to the surface, a change in the shape of the bubble. This change in the shape is a consequence of a reduction in surface tension. So we can monitorize from this kind of video, we can monitor the change in surface tension and measure surface tension against time. And here in this plot, you can see how injection of surfactant, which is working properly, is reducing surface tension in a fraction <clears throat> of a second from 70 millimeters uh, per meter, which is the typical surface tension of water, to less than almost 20 millimeters per meter. Then we can uh, compress and expand the bubble using a piston and it is represented here. And in this video, you can see how the shape of the bubble is changing further upon compression and expansion, mimicking compression expansion dynamics within breathing. We can represent surface tension against area. And you can see here how this surface tension upon compression is reduced even further to less than two millimeters per meter. This is what is, what is required to stabilize the lungs. And it does this in a very reproducible way upon many cycles, which is what uh, you need for stabilizing your lungs. This depends on a proper composition and structure of the material. If the material is not working properly because the composition is, uh, for instance, depleted of proteins, then it doesn't work as stable as it should. We can use this to monitor how surfactant is altered in different pathologies by taking, for instance, material from patients. Here, we, we can compare, for instance, this behavior of surface tension against area in material taken from babies with no lung disease and compare that uh, when we use material taken from the lungs of babies that suffer of meconium aspiration syndrome, which is a pathology as a consequence of uh, accidental inspiration of meconium during during birth, that creates a lung injury, inflammation, and inactivation of surfactant. And you can see how in those babies, the material never reach low enough surface tension, in, indicating that the inactivation of surfactant is, a, is a one of the factors inducing this pathology. And that could be treated as it is in these babies by uh, replacement with exogenous surfactant. And in the last uh, few minutes, let me show you that the, the research in this uh, pulmonary surfactant biophysics is coming to a new uh, line of application. Because as, as I said, the lung surfactant uh, um, feeling that is coating the alveolar spaces is the first material that is encountered by any uh, kind of um, uh, molecule or entity which is inhaled into our lungs. Uh, that, of course, uh, is important in order to understand toxicity of inhaled uh, products, for instance, uh, pollutants or, or uh, contaminant particles or, or any kind of toxic material, which um, effect on surfactant can be part of the, of the toxicity. But it's also important if we want to design 
much better in health medicines. For instance, if we want to deliver drugs uh, upon, upon inhalation, we need to understand how the drugs interact with surfactant because depending how they will interact, they will end deep into the lung or they will be cleared and removed away from the uh, airways. And we, uh, we, we can see here, for instance, how uh, the delivery into the trachea in an animal which is monitorized, for instance, in this case, a mice, is monitorized by infrared uh, fluorescent tomography. Here you see how the injection of a material in the trachea uh, monitorized over time, doesn't move very much, it's not spreading well ar ar uh, around the uh, airways, but if it is combined with the pulmonary surfactant with a proper composition containing the lipids and surfactant proteins, then very early upon delivering the trachea, the material is detected in the deep lung and taking the, the lungs out, uh, one can see how the material is uh, uh, completely homogeneously distributed, meaning that surfactant can be very useful as a, as a um, uh, drug delivery agent uh, upon combination properly with a drug. And we have developed in our laboratories in vitro systems to monitorize this kind of uh, um, spreading promoted by surfactant. For instance, a, a device like this in which you can combine donor and, re and receptor uh, compartment connect compartments connected by interfacial bridges somehow mimicking what happened when you deliver something in the upper airways upon inhalation and through the conductive airways, they have to reach the deep alveoli for that to, to have an, a proper effect. We have developed surface balances in which we can monitorize how material is moving from donor to recipient uh, compartments using the interface as a, as a pathway. And we have seen how the proper combination of a drug, like for instance, a corticosteroid like uh, beclometasone with surfactant is taking the material in a very efficient way from the donor to the recipient trough. If you combine the same drug with, uh, with lipids only in liposomes, which is a classical way to deliver drugs that are not properly soluble to make them more um, uh, bioavailable, then they never, that, in that case, only in liposomes, the drug never moves away from the donor to reach the recipient trough. And we have seen, and here you can see how different pulmonary surfactants, including material we can purify from lungs or the clinical surfactants that are uh, being used to treat babies, they are both very efficient to promote uh, 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 delivery of drugs. And we have seen that also in vivo in collaboration with the group of Jahar Bhattacharya in Columbia University using a mouse in which lung injury is induced by installation of uh, lipopolysaccharides um, uh, endotoxin and treating those uh, mouse intranasally either with an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, tacrolimus, or with surfactant or the combination of both. You can see here how um, Lung injury is seen by the presence of blood in the in the eye, in the airway uh, of the lungs, and you see that as as a consequence of inflammation and edema. This edema is not prevented at all if uh, the mouse are treated only with the anti-inflammatory drug of or only with surfactant, but is much more uh, prevented upon uh, treatment of the mouse with a combination of surfactant and the and the, uh, anti-inflammatory drug. And we see that also by checking in the infiltration of white blood cells as a consequence of inflammation, which is very much promoted when the drug is properly combined with surfactant. And in that case, we can see how the drug ends in the macrophages, which are the immune cells that are um, uh, somehow uh, protecting the lung deeply in the alveolar spaces, meaning that the, the drug is arriving that mass massively and facilitating also the uh, transepithelial uh, delivery into the blood and the, the systemic um, spreading. So in our uh, um, uh, more promising um, uh, research uh, uh, lines, we are now developing uh, different strategies to use surfactant uh, in, as a drug delivery agent in which we can facilitate not only the delivery of, of drugs, but also nanoparticles, which can carry 
um, nucleic acids, for instance, to facilitate uh, gene therapy or uh, gene silencing upon inhalation delivery, which is a very efficient way to take it uh, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, in a, in a let's say, pa patient-friendly way. So with all this, um, I hope I, I, can, I have been able to convince you that biophysics and the development of proper in vitro models can facilitate the development of new strategies and new therapeutic products, and that this can be done in a way that can be easily extended to uh, all countries and then facilitate uh, uh, a much better uh, health treatment for everybody in the world. And here, let me just uh, finish my, my talk by showing you our group, which is a combination of uh, physicists, biochemists, uh, physiologists, pharma pharmaceutics, uh, which is a kind of multidisciplinary work, which is required for this kind of approaches. This uh, building you have at the, at the bottom is the biology faculty here at Complutense University in Madrid. And uh, let me also thank all the funding agencies that have facilitated this over so many years. And, and thank you for, to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. This was really enlightening. So uh, we will now move to our next speaker, Miguel Gestano. Uh, do you manage to share your screen? Yes, first of all, well, good morning or good afternoon or good night, wherever you are. Let me just uh, then start here my sharing. I will uh, perform something. I will perform uh, a presentation that is more devoted to, um, well, let me see, I can start here. Are you seeing my presentation now? Uh, yes, but it's still not full screen. Ah, no, no it's, it's no, it's. Okay, so my presentation will be more like a, a, a communication exercise than exactly um, uh, tell you about the details of my science. I'll try to highlight how, it, how our biophysics is important, for instance, um, to try to be prepared and ready for the next big pandemic, which is now a big concern. Okay, so we, we went through the COVID pandemic and we know that future pandemics will come. Uh, we want to be prepared, we want to be ready, which is kind of a dilemma because one of the main characteristics of a pandemic is that you cannot exactly predict when the pandemic will come, what will be the agent that will cause the pandemic. So how, how can we be prepared so for something that we don't know what it is exactly and we don't know exactly when it comes. So, <clears throat> and, and how can we think about uh, how to uh, actually uh, control the impact of the next big pandemic? Moreover, what was the role of biophysics in actually controlling the impact and saving lives during the COVID pandemic? Here we have a timeline and several pandemics, um, mainly the, the, the Spanish flu here, the AIDS pandemic here. The dimension of these fuzzy balls is actually corresponds to the number of, of victims of, of uh, um, dead people during those pandemics. We, we, during the COVID, had 7 million reported uh, victims, mortal victims. Uh, the WHO estimates that the, 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 the real number can be as, as three times higher than that. But still, when compared to the, um, let me just, um, okay, let me just, uh, my pointer here. Okay, so when, com when comparing the dimension, okay, of the number of cases of the COVID-19 with AIDS or the Spanish flu, we see that it's relatively uh, uh, lower for a, for a population in the world that is much higher. Um, so somehow we were able to, con to contain, okay, the number of cases and the number of, of uh, 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 deadly victims in this pandemic, and we are actually trying to achieve uh, more and do better the next time. Now, pandemics or the potential from pandemics is, is higher than we tend to think. 
it's higher than we, we usually think of because the number of pandemics actually <clears throat> it's it's relatively uh, infrequent but the the outbreaks of potential pandemics are rel relatively uh, frequent this is also a timeline for the 21st century so it's only after year 2000 and there are several outbreaks with pandemic potential that occurred okay and they are very frequent and we know that the dynamics of of viruses in in nature they they um they include several species they, they can adapt to several species and they are actually subject to all kind of of uh, uh, imbalances that the environment is is facing now so we have to understand the basic biology of the viruses to actually be uh, ready to understand how they will evolve and so how, how what is the potential for a certain pandemic in the future so my point is that you really to understand the biology of the virus first so that you can control the disease in the end and that's where uh, biophysics comes um of course one of the 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 ways that you have to control a future pandemic is to develop broad spectrum antiviral drugs okay drugs that are potentially able to inactivate a, a, a very um, broad uh, range of different uh, viruses so that potentially it can include any viruses any virus any virus that will um, appear um, in the future okay? and so <clears throat> even the the world uh, health organization is actually trying to devise politics and and measures and incentives for to to be prepared and ready for the future of pandemics and and epidemics and our research which is basically biophysics research follows this this idea that we have to be prepared and that we have to be ready and so how can we use biophysics okay towards this goal to protect humanity um, um, from the next big pandemic well we're trying to focus on one um one uh, uh, family of virus that is actually um, uh, carried and distributed by a single species or mosquito or a single genus of mosquitoes so they are very well adapted to these uh, uh, mosquitoes from the genus aedes there are two main species in this genus but they the virus such as zika dengue yellow fever chikungunya they are very well adapted to these um, to these mosquitoes and they are very well adapted to humans too because now these mosquitoes will sting or bite okay humans and and so they they actually distribute these all these different viruses to humans okay? so we we thought this would be a good um uh, a good family of virus to test to test an uh, an a broad spectrum antiviral because they are different viruses among themselves but they are all adapted to humans and they were all optimized in nature for uh, two species mosquitoes and, and humans and mosquitoes and, and humans of course are, are very different moreover the the these are the, this 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 problem is 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 big okay it's huge now in in the globe um but the with with climate change and global warming the areas that the, the the these mosquitoes actually um colonize is spreading so the the threat which is already huge okay is getting huger so we thought we would concentrate on these viruses try to develop a broad spectrum antiviral using biophysics and that the lessons learned could be actually used eventually to create even broader um, um uh, spectrum uh, antiviral drugs and so far there are no medicines available so when you, when you cannot actually tackle the problem of of the virus then you go after the mosquitoes and for instance in in all south america you can find uh, um, uh, warnings like this so that you control the, the the reservoirs of still water so that you can eventually control the population of mosquitoes and so try to control the problem from the side of the mosquitoes because you don't have drugs to to antiviral drugs you have drugs to to control 
the effects of the virus, but you don't have drugs to actually inactivate the virus itself. So using biophysics, we had to imagine what could be okay, the target in the virus that could be used uh, um, and, and would grant a broad spectrum antiviral activity because you have to have a, a, a common feature among all these different viruses so that you can actually attack the viruses using this, this common feature, this common target. And if we look to the structure of dengue, Zika, even Ebola or, or HIV, which are not in this, in this class that is carried by the, the, these mosquitoes, um, the common feature is that they all have an envelope. They all have a membrane. They all have a lipid bilayer. And now we are thinking molecularly, meaning that we are thinking in terms of biophysics, okay? Trying to devise a drug is, is an exercise that requires molecular thinking. So, and if you think the interaction of molecules, you're thinking biophysics, okay? That's, that's the point. So we, we tried to develop a drug that could actually attack the membrane, the envelope of the viruses. Uh, at variance with cells, viruses cannot repair damage on the, on the membrane, okay? Cells can, okay? But viruses cannot. So a, a small, a mild uh, lesion for a cell would be a devastating lesion for a virus. So that's the initial concept. And we started this project that is funded by the European Union called No Viruses to Brain. I will not go into details, but if you want to know more about this project, it's here in this, in this um, website. And the most challenging of all the viruses that we are trying to address in this project is actually Zika, Zika virus, because it is able, the virus, to cross the blood-brain barrier of an adult, that is to say, to cross the arteria in the brain so it goes from the blood to the brain and it may cause it doesn't happen to all but it may cause to some some uh, uh, neurological lesions so lesions in the brain have effects in the brain but the, dramatically it can also cross the blood uh, placental barrier reach the fetus in in pregnant women and cause severe neurological damage to the fetus to, to, to the baby that is developing. And this is devastating. This is one, uh, one devastating feature of uh, Zika virus. So we used Zika virus as our test case, okay? And because it's also the most challenging, we have to find a drug that is able to cross the blood brain barrier, to cross from the blood to the brain and protect the brain, to cross from the, the blood placental barrier that is to reach the fetus and, and protect the fetus. So that's the, the, the ambition challenging from, from the beginning. We knew <clears throat> from previous work using biophysics, um, using our biophysical reasoning, that uh, a certain class of molecules, that is porphyrins, they are able to insert in the envelope of different viruses okay, and produce lesions in this envelope. So we had a basic structure for a broad antiviral molecule. But we, we need to put it, to place it in, in, in the brain. We need to place it in the fetus in the case of, of pregnant women. And of course, we need to test better the efficacy of this molecule in, in, in activating viruses by destroying the, their, their envelope in vivo, that is to say, in an animal uh, setting, in an animal environment, okay? Because in a test tube, it's it's more or less easy, but in 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 a, a physiological environment inside an animal, inside a person, it's, it's it's different. So we had this molecule that could potentially fit uh, the purpose, uh, but it, we needed to uh, transport it to the brain. What was the solution then? Uh, well, we used actually um, parts of proteins, domains of proteins from dengue virus, ironically, um, from the capsid of the dengue virus, 
So we went to a virus to seek for tools that would enable us to fight the virus, which is kind of ironic for, for the virus. But viruses are actually uh, molecular machines that were optimized by nature to enter cells. So it's not at all surprising that we go and look for tools to transverse cells in, 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 in virus. So we found these, these called peptides, okay, these domains of, of proteins in viruses that could help us actually take the antiviral molecule inside cells and across cells. So <clears throat> that could help us carry these antiviral molecules from the blood to the brain or from the blood to the placenta. Okay? So what we did in the project was simply okay, a binding these, these porphyrins, these antiviral molecules, with these peptides, with these fragments of, of proteins into a conjugate. And we hoped that this conjugate would maintain the characteristics of the, the, the antiviral molecule and the transport molecule. Okay? So we would hope that this construct would cross from the blood to the brain and it would inactivate viruses there. So <clears throat> we started by, by synthesizing these molecules, of course, and then again comes the, the molecular reasoning. You have to know the molecules, you have to know the specific um, um, groups, chemical groups of the molecules so that you know how to combine them. This is a purely molecular um, uh, science work. Okay? And then we tested the, the molecules for their capacity to translocate across the, the cells of, that constitute the walls of the arteria in the brain. We did that in vitro. So we grow the cells to separate the compartments and then we test the transport across the compartments. And, and, and we use cells for the blood-brain barrier. We use cells for the blood placental barrier. And we test and compare to a control, of course, we test the capacity of these molecules to go from one chamber to the other. Okay. Then for um, antiviral activity, we started checking the antiviral activity with HIV, not with Zika initially. Um, we started with HIV because it was easier, basically, because it's uh, from, from the AIDS pandemic, we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of capacity to test uh, anti-HIV activity. And HIV also has an envelope. So in principle, if it would work for um, um, all viruses that have envelope, it would also work for HIV. And the first test was for HIV. And we found that at, at relatively low concentrations, uh, actually we get antiviral activity from the molecules. So from, from the first experiments, all in vitro, meaning all in the laboratory, we, we knew that there was the potential to cross uh, from the blood to, to, the, to the brain or the placenta. And we knew that the antiviral activity was maintained. Okay. Then we tested <clears throat> different conjugates here in different colors for um, Zika, and dengue for antiviral activity indeed in Zika and dengue. This is kind of the number of virus present in, in a sample. This is concentration of, of, of um, the drug, okay, of the tentative drug. And you'll see here that in some cases, some conjugates are actually able to cause severe drops. Okay, these are these are orders of magnitude, severe drops in the quantity of viruses. So they are actually also able not only to, to control the replication of HIV, but also Zika and, and dengue. Not all conjugates work for all the viruses, which uh, challenges the idea of a, a broad spectrum uh, antivirals from the beginning, but that is science. I mean, it, it doesn't come as, uh, uh, the results are not always what you have planned for and, and, and resulted. 
Um, so the, the important here is that some conjugates are actually having the activity we hope for. Then the, 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 the final um, the tests were for the, the way that the molecules use to cross from the blood to the brain, and there are different ways to go across cells from one side um, to the other of epithelia, and then uh, scientifically and, and in a, with a biophysics reasoning, we selectively inhibit some, okay, some steps here. We uh, then check the result, and so we try to reconstitute what is the pathway of the molecules uh, in the cells of the arteria so that they can, can cross from the blood to the brain or to the to the placenta. These are the results. So uh, there are actually two inhibitors that actually have an impact on the crossing. So we know that the, the, the molecules use certain routes, specific routes, and what these are routes are across, across the cells. This is important to develop other molecules uh, in the future. Then we perform also some animal tests and the uh, animal tests are challenging here because for instance zika or dengue they are human virus they are not adapted to rodents for instance so you don't have zika disease in in mice for instance so it's difficult to test the drugs in, in mice because they don't get zika disease we have to create a situation which is zika disease like in in some animals uh, and that's what we are doing now uh, with uh, um, um, very appealing results. We are also uh, trying to find industrial partners now that would help us further develop the molecules and reach the first in human uh, tests. But that's another story, and that I will leave that for the next the next uh, um, presentation, whenever that is. UPUB will certainly continue uh, its efforts. Um, towards outreaching um, these activities. Um, and uh, before just just uh, uh, thanking the people that, that actually did most of the work and, and the funders, I hope I have uh, um, uh, transmitted the idea that when we think about pandemics, we think about you know doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, we do not see at first glance biophysicists there being healthcare professionals, um, but they are certainly part of the process of protecting the lives of, of people in this uh, situation. So this is mainly my, my main message. E and, and we are working towards the next uh, big pandemic. So I thank all the people in my group that, that worked in this uh, research line. I also thank the EAC, the European, European Innovation Council, that funded most of, of the work and our, our national funding uh, agency, FCT. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was in, in time. Thank you very much, Miguel. This was a really interesting talk. So this is the end of uh, the session, Biophysics for Global Health and Sustainability. Thank you again to all our speakers. Thank you all for following the session. <laughs>